atherosclerosis is an autoimmune disease. Um, it involves damage to the myelin sheath running down the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so symptoms can be varied uh, depending on how soon you're diagnosed after you uh, contract uh, multiple sclerosis, but symptoms include paresthesias uh, down one side of the arm, weakness, uh, tingling, uh, increased fatigue, uh, prone to overheating, and a bunch of other stuff. Visual acuity is usually one of the first signs, right, Jake? Yeah, um, I believe it's so. usually has to do with uh, sometimes neuritis, so the optic nerve will get inflamed, and that'll cause I think like an eighty percent acuity, so it's like a twenty percent decrease about. And yeah, what's, the, what's the term they use? The term they use um, for somebody one of the first. You, you're right when you're talking about visual. It's not so much visual acuity, but they use the term. I give you a hint. Yes, you Oh, yeah, Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. Yes, 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 this doesn't really improve. Just raise your volume a little bit, Jake. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. So the people in the back can hear you. Yeah, MS definitely uh, <coughs> doesn't improve for the most part. You know, it's kind of where you go know, into the treatment, you know, a few slides down, but definitely just trying to maintain what the patient has at that point in their is MS life cycle is very important. Um, another thing actually is uh, emotional state of a lot of MS patients. They tend to be more prone to depression, which is why exercise can help. Um, fatigue is a, is a big problem with them as well. There's no, I think there's no evidence-based finding on what causes the fatigue specifically that I could find anyway. Um, well, you could probably, you know, using critical thinking, you yeah. could figure it out. Why, why would you think they would be fatigued? What is, the, what is one of the hallmarks of MS in terms of what's happening? Spinal cord yeah, is getting yeah, demyelinated. Right. So, so what's what does that mess up? Nerve impulses. Correct. So yeah, not, your, your, your muscles are not getting the impulses. Yeah. So they're not going to be able to do everything that you ask them to do as often as you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. So hence the fatigue factor is a big issue because of that. Yeah. Because of the pathology of the disease. Yeah. But good of you to pick up on that. That that's one of the big things. That's actually I think uh, in our intervention, PT intervention too. That's one of the bigger focuses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I just a quick picture here of kind of like, you know, what a normal, uh, my, what normal myelin looks like. And then this is demyelinated in the case of someone that has MS. So you can kind of see how those signals passing back and forth uh, would be diminished or decreased. It also kind of relates to, or I mean, we can actually go into that, but it also yeah. kind of relates to the thermoregulatory issues that a lot of MS patients, that all MS patients will have. Um, so modalities are usually contraindicated when it comes to heat because they can eat very easily, so usually they'll be in an AC environment or something where they can control the temperature, uh, even having cold cryotherapy on hand just in case. So yeah, so just to go over, um, I didn't actually know this until we started researching on MS, but I guess there's different types of uh, MS, which is pretty interesting. So we have first one, RRMS, uh, which is the most common occurring up to 85% of uh, MS patients, and that's relapse remitting. So it's characterized by uh, short attacks and exasperations to uh, the myelin, and then partial or full recovery um, to their prior level of function. And then there's a few others. So we have SPMS, uh, secondary progressive. It presents, uh, presents as relapse remitting, but it's then followed by a steady decline in function. So RRMS, they kind of return to their prior level of function, but SPMS, they kind of keep going down after their exasperations. Then we have PPMS, uh, which is a steady decline is expected from the onset of diagnosis. And then there's PRMS, uh, progressive relapsing, which is similar to primary progressive with the additional characteristic of the key of the tests. And on the diagnosis aspect, like it's a PowerPoint, there's no specific tests, but they use blood testing, lumbar punctures, MRIs, EVPs, EVPT, EVPT. That's the only true definitive test is the MRI. Right? Is the MRI?
MRI? The MRI because they're looking for the characteristic plaques that form the spinal cord. Years ago with MS, it used to be thought of as a hysterical disease. Now, why do you think they thought that? What is the, what is the subset of the population who was more affected? 20 to 40. 20 to 50. It's 20 to 50. Not age. Not age. Oh, uh, I want to say it's more youth at the beginning of the Not youth. Yes, it's female. Female. Okay. So hence the hysterical. Women back 20, 30 years ago would come to the doctor, especially if they had like the relapsing remitting. They have these symptoms. They come to the doctor with double vision and difficulty in walking, and then all the symptoms, the symptoms would subside. A lot of these doctors would tell since they didn't have MRIs back then, the doctor would say, it's all in your head. Go see a psychiatrist, because you're fine now. Until they finally came up with the MRI and have the definitive proof now. I treated a woman who had MS for 20 years before they would actually tell her that she had MS. Because they couldn't find any proof because they didn't have an MRI or a CAT scan when she first started in her late 20s, early 30s. Was that against the symptom? So that was a very frustrating thing for these women to go to the doctor and have the doctor say, guess what, it's all in your head. When there actually was a physical manifestation of the disease. Really no specifically, there's no genetic implications. Um, but I mean this kind of explains on the physiological level what happens. The T cells become sensitized to proteins in the CNS, and the T cells become activated and enter CNS through blood vessels and produce damaging inflammation and deterioration. Definitely, yeah, uh, same thing. Um, you know, all of these factors definitely play into um, having an MS diagnosis. So you know, looking into environmental factors. I was actually thinking about it a little bit. I guess it kind of made sense, um, you know, the further away from the equator you live, the colder environment you live in, the more prone you are to developing MS. Not too sure why that happens. Yeah, yeah that's um, what they want to MS is one of those idiopathic kind of yeah. things where they don't have a, a good handle on what the, core, the root cause is. They know that in some cases it can be tied to the environment. Into you whether you have a good immune system or not. And also, there's a genetic component sometimes because if a woman has it, if she, she has female children, there's a good percentage, a good possibility that her, one of her female children will have also have MS. Yeah. Which is interesting. There's because no great tie to it because there's no chromosomal abnormality that exists that they can say, like, MD. Yeah, that's why it, that was definitely interesting. It's not hereditary, but there is right. a genetic component. Yeah, there can be a genetic component, so. yeah. yeah. But as we well, yeah, even Absolutely. though it may not be chromosomal related, there is still a bit of a genetic component, but I think with MS you've got multiple factors at play. Can we move on to the treatment of multiple sclerosis? Yep, so uh, there's definitely a few different, uh, you know, interventions that you can do, obviously, uh, pharmacologically, um, you know, medication. Most MS patients, I think, are medicated um, to bring down the severity of their symptoms and definitely therapeutic interventions, um, which should include what we do is PTs and PTAs, um, activity level regulation, uh, energy conservation techniques, because they are gonna fatigue very quickly. Um, and then of course, it definitely depends on uh, where they're at in their MS diagnosis and kind of life cycle, because someone in later stages with MS uh, might not be walking as much, they might need an assistive device at that point. So at that point, it's just kind of, you know, maintaining what they have and kind of making sure that they can, you know, ambulate on their own or get out of bed on their own and transfer to their wheelchair or use their assistive devices. It's important to emphasize, too, the energy conservation aspect of it because while, I mean, a lot of our treatments and interventions are going to be incorporating energy conservation to kind of coaching them, you know, uh, and monitoring heart rate, RP, breaks and also being aware of and most of the time there is a cognitive impairment that can be mild to moderate I think um, so verbal cues and tactile cues and making sure that they really understand what's being worked on is really important so you can talk to them about how that affects their function um, so a lot of exercises tend to be based on that and actually the next slide you want to go to the video? yeah sure yeah we can pause here and bring up the video. so for So, yeah. 
Yeah, we just did a couple minute video of some basic exercises that will simulate certain fluid that you could use for different levels of MS patients, like with um, different, uh, I guess, conditioning levels would be the way to put it. So, one second. You have a very willing volunteer patient. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. always willing to help us out. Always ready. This first exercise, um, you'll see it coming up in a minute, uh, will be Justin on his knees um, doing just a basic kind of intro exercise, nothing too crazy, um, but just reaching across his body, across midline, grabbing one of these cones that Jake has in his hands here, um, and then reaching back across midline to hand the cones back to Jake. This exercise was uh, picked out um, to challenge Justin's balance, coordination, um, and stability, making these deeper core muscles work and fire a little bit. And oh. <laughs> horrible idea, got that. The next exercise you'll see us do um, is just a bird dog exercise. So this exercise is definitely um, a little bit more intense, a little bit more demanding on the body systems than the previous cone drill exercise that you had us, uh, that you saw us do. So Justin here is just alternating with um, opposite arm and leg, outstretching his hand uh, to meet Jake's hand as he holds it up in front of him. So this definitely challenges, again, balance, stability, um, you know, core muscles, uh, lower back muscles, and actually um, eye coordination as well to actually reach his hand out and touch Jake's hand. This last exercise you'll see us uh, do um, it's just simply, uh, again, testing balance, um, specifically the motor component of balance. So bringing it back to our data collections class from quarter two, um, just kind of giving Justin some forces, uh, pushing them in each different direction, uh, testing ankle strategies, hip strategies, and uh, stepping strategies, um, trying to keep his center of gravity over his base of support. Um, and this exercise as well can be a great indication of uh, fall risk potential, especially with... Yeah. What, are those, what are those forces called? Uh, Pertuberations. Perturbations. 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 You're not just pushing your patient around. Exactly. Perturbations. <laughs> it's, it's therapeutic. Right? You're, telling you, you're telling the patient, it's I'm not going to push you around. This is therapeutic for you. Yep. <laughs> So more importantly in those exercises was like probably the first one where we had Justin on his knees and we were simulating I think it's a D2 flexion extension there and you can also do D1 flexion extension too, which are PNF techniques that kind of also related to like taking things off of high shelves or eating. So kind of exercise to incorporate those to kind of help them maintain whatever function they have. Um, and actually the article that we, or not the article, but the evidence-based article on that we gave Mike, uh, the whole treatment is based around energy conservation and literally just taking things off of shelves in different areas. And I think you said something about circuit training. So what is, yeah, circuit, what is circuit training? Circuit training is different circuits of, of types of exercises. Yeah. And you kind of, you kind of, and fortunately you kind of picked up a little yes. bit on that because what I do want, what I did want to, to emphasize is whatever evidence-based treatment they found in the article to demonstrate that evidence-based treatment. So you had him moving to different circuits, quote unquote. So yeah, that, that, that kind of covered it for you. Yeah. That was that's kind of what we wanted to show. Okay. Um, the last few slides here, I think we have two slides left really quick. Um, but yeah, you know, we was trying to spice up the PowerPoint first of all by adding in a few <laughs> pictures. But um, you know, I saw PowerPoints were designed for pictures. <laughs> um, you know, so this uh, just from Penn Medicine, I guess, it's from Penn University, was saying, you know, that people with MS do work and are part of the workforce. And I thought that was kind of important. So I was thinking of, you know, so what's modifying the biggest, what's the biggest your PT interventions. Right. What's the biggest proponent for that? What, is, what do we know that makes that possible? Something you guys learned about way back in quarter one. What's the question? How, how you're saying employee and multiple sclerosis, yes, people with MS can work. Yep. MS is considered a chronic disease. There are limitations. What in 
enables these people to work now? There's something that happened that enabled these people to work. ABA. ABA made that possible. I treated a nurse who had MS, and she worked in a skilled nursing facility, and she did most, most of her work was done from a wheelchair level because of the ADA. They were able to incorporate that in there. She had severe enough MS that she didn't, couldn't walk long distances, but she could stand for periods of time and whatnot. But she was able to work in a chronic nursing facility because of the ADA. She was able to work from a wheelchair. And that's what we owe the ADA. So for contraindications and, I mean, for anything with MS, um, MS, like we said, big issues, thermoregulatory and their fatigue level, so exacerbations, and making sure that they stay within um, a certain exertion level is really important, um, and especially making sure they don't overheat. Because no matter what you do, those are two things that can happen with a patient with MS. So on the side, I've actually found from the neuro book we'll be using next quarter, the statistic, so patients, like I said, they would be verbalizing their current exhaustion levels by utilizing an RPE scale like we learned in data. And um, also for deconditioned patients, so this apparently didn't happen, but it said you want to keep it between 50 and 60% of their max heart rate. So with someone with a patient who's more conditioned, 60 to 80 is more appropriate, but for deconditioned, they say 50 to 60 is a good way to start. Um, and we mentioned overheating, so making sure that they're well hydrated and making sure that there's cryotherapy available and AC fans, anything to keep them cool. What time of year is worse for MS patients? So, 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 yeah. This is why a lot of folks with MS tend to move to a cooler climate. So, because yeah. it's a lot easier for them to get around because again, the heat plays a part in it saps and it makes their fatigue worse. It's not better. 